let's let's talk about filigran as well and the importance of it on the skin. Let's do a breakdown on on first of all what filigran is. Yeah. So filigran is a protein that's found in the skin and we call it the master regulator of the skin barrier because it's so critical to um helping us create and maintain healthy skin. I mean, I think we all know, you know, skin is really supposed to function, you know, on its own. And skin is a very complicated job because it has to keep some stuff in, right? It has to keep our blood and our fluid inside our body, but then it has to let some things out, right? Like we sweat and it's also an organ of detoxification. So things have to come out of the skin and vice versa from the outside world, right? It has to keep outside world out. Like we don't want bacteria and viruses and things getting through the skin, but then certain things are absorbed into the skin, like moisture and like lotions and topicals. It's like skin has a very, very complicated job. It's not just like a hard shell of a turtle where it's like nothing gets in, nothing gets out, you know, end of story. And filaggrin is, is just a major protein in the skin that helps get this done, that makes sure it has the same, the right level of hydration, right? We don't want wet skin, but we don't want too dry skin. It's just always this balance. And it's amazing, actually, how most of the time it's functioning well. Um, filaggrin goes on to build something called Natural Moisturizing Factor, NMF. And Natural Moisturizing Factor, I think, is a very well-named substance because it explains what it does. It keeps our skin naturally moisturized. Now, when we think of skin with eczema, you know, do we feel like there's enough filaggrin? Do we feel like there's enough natural moisturizing factor? I think we all know the answer is no, right? Eczematous skin is, it's broken, it's inflamed, it's not hydrated, it's dry, like it's all messed up. Now, What's the relationship to filaggrin? So there's an FLG, which is a filaggrin gene, and there's more than one. So in Caucasians, it's like FLG. In um, African, those of African descent, it's FLG2. Uh, but these genes can also determine how much kind of filaggrin your skin naturally produces. And if someone has a filaggrin gene mutation or an FLG2 mutation, then their, their filaggrin production can be kind of impaired and put them at risk for eczema. There's not, so FLG gene mutations are really only testable mostly in like research. It's not like your doctor can order a filaggrin gene mutation test for you. But I feel like we kind of know, like my patients who are either infants or, you know, they're saying, I got it when I was an infant and now I've had it my whole life. I think we could pretty well assume that they have a filaggrin gene mutation and they're they don't produce as much filaggrin or natural moisturizing factor as like normal controls. So that's going to put somebody at risk of getting eczema because, you know, if you're not producing enough filaggrin and enough natural moisturizing factor, your skin is kind of impaired. The pH is off. Uh, we've talked about skin pH needing to be acidic. Um, natural moisturizing factor is made of acid. So, um, L-histidine and L-glutamine are two of the biggest amino acids, acids, and then they form the NMF, which is acidic. So filaggrin and natural moisturizing factor create that acidic profile on the skin and keep it healthy and keep it moisturized. So if you don't have enough of it, you know, then you're more compromised and more likely to get eczema. But not everybody who has eczema has a filaggrin gene mutation, especially those who maybe got it a little bit older or, you know, aren't that prone to getting it. In either event, um, when you have an eczema flare, your filaggrin production is being down-regulated. And that is because, have we talked about the Th2 cells and the cytokines? Or I don't think we have. Has your listeners talked about that? Nope, that would be a good one to talk about. Okay, so we have different immune responses in the body, and we know eczema is an atopic disease, an allergic disease, and our allergic immune response are called Th2 cells, T helper 2 cells. The Th2 pathway is the allergic pathway, so that causes the atopic triad, food allergies, eczema, and asthma, right? Um, when you're having an eczema outbreak, your Th2 levels are increased and those Th2 cells produce inflammatory cytokines, which are inflammatory chemicals like IL-4, IL-13. And if your patients have heard of dupixent or dupilumab, it's that ingestible biologic for eczema. Dupixent 
tries to quash those Th2 cells and those cytokines I just mentioned. That's how Dupixent works in eczema patients. But in anyone who's having a flare, the Th2 cells are active, the IL-4 and IL-13 are active. And for reasons we don't fully understand, those cytokines downregulate the production of filaggrin. So it's kind of like the worst case scenario. Right when you're having the flare, when we need filaggrin and natural moisturizing factor, the inflammation is suppressing the production of it. And that's why some people are stuck in this like rut where they can't get out of it and they can't produce, you know, normal healthy filaggrin and natural moisturizing factor to get out of it because the flare is keeping them in it. So, okay, what do we do? Um, you know, there are ways to help um, improve filaggrin production. Um, one is um, staph aureus will also inhibit the production of filaggrin. So we want to clean up staph aureus on the skin. And you can link to our staph aureus chats because I think we've chatted a lot about that. So we don't need to rehash all that here, but your listeners can go listen to it. Um, but there's also, I talked about that there's amino acids that make up the lagrin and natural moisturizing factor, L-histidine and L-glutamine. And there's also um, studies on like L-histidine supplementation. So again, I am not telling you to go out and dose yourself with L-histamine or L-glutamine, but um, I do use, you know, some amino acids to help for a certain time my patients at the beginning to build up that filaggrin and natural moisturizing factor. And then I ramp them off it. Um, I don't keep them on that for forever and ever. Got it. Thank you for sharing. H have you heard much about the hyperlinear palms and if that signifies the filaggrin gene mutation? You know, I don't know. Um, again, I mean, we, I, unless you do a study and you're testing for FLG and now FLG, well, there was this whole, um, kind of gap in knowledge where African Americans are more prone to getting eczema than Caucasian counterparts, but they kept testing them for FLG mutations and nothing was coming up. And then it turned out in, in Africa, those of African descent is FLG two. So I, I just don't think we know enough. I don't think there's been enough testing of, you know, filaggrin gene mutations that we would know, but I haven't heard anything connecting that, but that doesn't mean that it's not out there. For sure. So we have some listeners who might be asking, how can I test if I do have a gene mutation? Um, is there a recommended test that you would usually recommend? Yeah, again, you can't, this is, you can't go ask your doctor for a filaggrin gene mutation test. It's things that's done like in research only. Um, same for, you know, while we're at it, the, the findings in the test uh, in the research report that we talked about, about TSW, you can't go to your doctor and ask for this, right? This is only done within a research setting. So there's no way to know. Again, I usually can tell if a patient has had eczema since they were an infant and struggled with eczema for a large part of their life, I kind of assume that they have a filaggrin gene mutation, but there's nothing we can do for genes anyway. So in many ways, it's irrelevant whether somebody has one or not. We can't change your genes. We're not at that point where we can go in and change the, you know, DNA. Um, and just because somebody has a filaggrin gene mutation does not mean that they are um, doomed to have eczema for the rest of their life. It just means that they're more prone to it. They need to understand all the factors and the root causes and keep things in order. Because if something gets a little bit off, their trigger point for eczema is going to be a lot lower than somebody without a filaggrin gene mutation. Thanks for sharing. What are some of your favorite moisturizers to help someone who's going through a filaggrin um, gene deficiency? Um, for example, ceramides, or do you have some favorite topicals yeah. that you like? Yeah, I mean, I do think, you know, it, it's different for me. When somebody is in full-blown TSW, there's not, it's like, whatever we can use that's not like totally aggravating, you know, I'm sure your TSW listeners understand. And there's a whole, you know, no moisture therapy in TSW. But if we're just talking about eczema and it's really, really bad eczema, again, when the skin barrier is super inflamed and super disrupted, you're not going to be able to find that much to use on it. So ceramide rich creams at that point, I do find are the most helpful. Then as the skin starts to get better, the topical world opens up a lot more. We can start using things like ap diluted apple cider vinegar and other things that we could never use at the beginning. The beginning, like even aloe vera and water can burn and stuff like that. But I do think ceramide heavy cream at the beginning with really severe eczema can be helpful. 
Do you have any favorite brands that you like? Just because I know our listeners will also be asking. Uh, for yeah, there's this isn't cheap, but there's a Cheryl Lee MD. I think it's like $44 a tube for a small tube, but in real severe patients. And I don't, it's not super natural. Um, so I don't use that after, you know, the initial, once the skin is improved, we move away from stuff like that. We move more into like, you know, oils and, and body butters and balms and stuff like that. Um, but that one can be helpful at the beginning with really, really compromised skin. Thank you for sharing. That's all really helpful, especially as I know it's not something that everyone pays attention to or comes across as well. And um, I know we're near the end of our time too. Is there any last words or advice that you want to give, um, especially when it comes to flagrin? Um, again, you know, there's nothing that you can do if you have a, a gene mutation, but it really is not something that's going to doom you. So um, again, if you work with, you know, a licensed healthcare provider who's knowledgeable about filaggrin and ways to kind of help the body with it, um, you can help, you know, kind of zhuzh the filaggrin short term so that you can get up and over that hump. And then, you know, once you're in a normal state and the skin is healthy, your filaggrin is, is fine. Sounds good. And one last thing, have you seen if omega-3 fish oils or any of the internal omega oils can, can help with it? So I, I don't know specifically as it relates to filaggrin, if the fish oils can help. Um, what I do think fish oil is helpful with is one, we know it's anti-inflammatory. It kind of reduces that COX inflammatory COX pathway. Um, but also, you know, the skin is built with phospholipids or fats. There's a phospholipid bilayer. So there's a lot of fat that goes into skin and it's going to take whatever fat is floating around in the body. Fish oil is a nice, wonderful, supple fat. So it, it helps build, you know, more flexible, healthy skin, um, as well as being anti-inflammatory. So as long as someone's not allergic to fish, right, we're talking about eczema, there's a lot of allergies and a lot of eczema patients have allergies to fish, don't give them fish oil. But if you're not, I do think uh, there's, there's a lot of benefits of fish oil. I just haven't seen research as it relates specifically to filaggrin. Thank you for sharing. Everything that you shared today was so helpful. I really appreciate your time, Julie. 